you speak of the of the uh, case in uh, in Australia. Yeah. Well, in Australia, there was a man uh, who uh, it's claimed infected three women, and I think one woman died. And the defense of the man, uh, I don't know if the, I don't know the details if he did it deliberate, if he knew. I don't want to get into that and what the punishment should be. But the question is, is his defense was an absurdity, but uh, that the virus uh, didn't exist. The biggest problem with the HIV theory of AIDS is HIV. There is a group of AIDS denialists that say that HIV does not exist and has never been isolated, and which is <laughs> as bizarre as it gets. You and your colleagues not only state that HIV does not cause AIDS, but you take an even greater leap and say HIV does not exist. Is that correct? Oh, it is partly correct. We do not say that HIV doesn't exist. It may exist. But the presently available data does not prove its existence. But how can you say that when world-renowned scientists like Dr. Gallo and Dr. Fauci say HIV does exist? Are you telling me and the world that they're all wrong? No, what, I, what we're saying is there is the evidence there, the data in the scientific literature, which is published. Scientists interpret data differently, and we interpret the evidence one way, and they interpret it in a different way. So, in our view, the evidence does not prove the existence of HIV. We've all seen pictures. We've seen electron micrographs of HIV. How can you say something that we see isn't there? You didn't see electromicrograph of HIV. What we see is electromicrograph of particles which look like retroviruses. But uh, it's one thing to look like and another thing is to be a virus. The one thing I don't understand is how can you question the existence of a virus when there was an international lawsuit against the United States government and Robert Gallo for stealing the French virus? I mean, it seems to me there must be a virus there if somebody stole it. That's the problem. Under no circumstances, uh, Robert Gallo could have stolen uh, Montagnier's virus, even if there was such a virus. Because what Montagnier sent to Gallo was uh, um, supernatants from his cultures. And in the supernatant, the virus says, don't last for too long. And in fact, the the, the particles have to have knobs on their, or spikes, on their surface to be infectious. And these knobs are lost. And in fact, nobody has proven that they exist. But even if they exist on HIV or the particles, they are lost very rapidly. So it is impossible for Montagnier's, for, uh, to have, for Gallo to have stolen a virus from Montagnier. So can you prove to me that HIV doesn't exist? I can, I can show you what the evidence shows, what, what Montagnier, for example, presented, because everybody accepts that Montagnier is the discoverer of HIV. And I can show you the evidence which Montagnier presented and claims to have proven the existence of HIV. And I will explain to you why Montagnier's evidence does not prove the existence of HIV. What do we mean by virus isolation or virus purification? Um, these are jargon words in virology and they, uh, they're not very precise. They mean different things to different people. Now, Dr. Gallo and Dr. Fauci talked a lot about isolation and purification. Can you tell me what the difference is between the two? Isolation, what was it? Isolation and purification. Of the virus? Yes. Well, you isolate a virus by um, um, finding the virus which causes a disease. And you purify a virus by making a lot of, I mean, just by purifying it so you get a pure virus. Okay. I, don't, I don't understand what the issue. Well, they, they, issue. Can, they, they interchanged the two, and I wasn't sure I see. If, if it was the same thing or if it was two totally different. Uh, no, it depends on how they used it. Okay. 
Can, can you explain the process of HIV isolation? Well, I didn't Dr. Gallo do that? I mean, he actually isolated it, so. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, why should I do all of this? This is all textbook stuff you're asking me. I'm not quite sure what's behind your question about isolation. I don't want to be your textbook, you know? Okay. I got other things to do. Isolation is essentially um, getting the, the virus from the patient and being able to transmit this virus to another cell to reproduce the infection and to have a continual supply of the virus, and that's called an isolation. Purification is just obtaining the virus uh, free of cellular contaminants or other contaminations, but it doesn't mean necessarily that the virus is infectious. Virus isolation, I would take to mean that uh, you take some infected material, like a, a blood sample uh, from someone who you uh, think or, or believe may have HIV infection, may already have symptoms of AIDS, and you try and grow the virus uh, from that blood sample. So you would put the blood sample into culture, you would stimulate the lymphocytes to proliferate with various growth factors or cytokines and you would harvest the virus from the, uh, the culture medium that you're growing it in. Uh, you would spin out the cells, um, separate the cells from the supernatants and you would look for the virus in the, uh, in the culture medium. That needn't be a pure medium because you can use markers of the virus that tell you it's there such as the reverse transcriptase enzyme. So you can see evidence of the virus without actually purifying particles. In that very first paper from the French group, published in May 1983, uh, there were two things that uh, uh, appeared to uh, class it amongst the retrovirus uh, uh, family. Uh, one was reverse transcriptase activity and one was actually looking at virus particles with the electron microscope. The title of the 1983 paper by Montagnier and his colleague is Isolation of a T-Lymphotropic Retrovirus from a Patient at Risk of Acquired Immune Deficiency Syndrome, AIDS. Now, the word isolation means to obtain something or to place something apart or to obtain a, sep a substance separate from everything else. Apparently, Montagnier by isolation did not mean this, but something totally different. And I'll, I'll explain to what he meant by, by isolation. He did three main experiments. The first experiment, he took lymphocytes from a patient, now is known as Brew, and he cultured them with many uh, substances including PHA and other growth factors. What are growth factors? They are substances which make cell to multiply. Okay. Right? Or to live, and to, to, to stay alive in the culture. Mm -hmm. And after 15 days, he discovered their reverse transcriptase activity. And they claimed that this proved the existence of a retrovirus in their patient, in their patient cells. So every two days we were taking the supernatant, looking for the presence of the enzymes that transform RNA to DNA, the reverse transcriptase, because we know that this enzyme is associated to virus particle. So we were testing for this enzyme activity in the supernatant. What's so special about reverse transcription? Any time you're searching for a new agent, you want to have some simple measurement of the presence of that agent. Um, in times past, you would put it on cells, cell culture in the laboratory, and suddenly these beautiful cells will all start turning into dead cells. You say, oh, something's there. And then you 
put that into an electron microscope and look and you can find it. All those are rather difficult things to use. If there's something that the virus produces in this culture, you don't necessarily have to see all the dead stuff. You just can have, take off some of the liquid it's growing in and test it. Um, and one thing you can test for a retrovirus is reverse transcriptase. And it just happens to be that's a laboratory test available for it. So you just take a little bit off, put it into a chemical assay, and you can do it very, very simply. So it's a matter of something that you can put a lot of specimens through and something that's simple to do so you can really uh, uh, get a, maybe not a direct picture of the virus, you can't see it, but you can get evidence that it is there, like fingerprints. Then he took the lymphocytes, which originated from bruised uh, lymph nodes, he took these lymphocytes and cultured them with the lymphocytes of a healthy blood donor. And there, again, he detected reverse transcriptase activity. So Montagnier did, found reverse transcriptase activity, and according to him, this proved that the retrovirus was there. But the, the only way to say that the existence of reverse transcriptase or the detection of reverse transcriptase activity proves the retrovirus was there is only if reverse transcription was specific to retroviruses, which is not the case. In fact, the, today nearly everybody accepts that reverse transcription or reverse transcription activity is non-specific to retroviruses. In fact, at present, everybody accepts that reverse transcript transcription is present in all normal cells. In fact, as far back as at the beginning of the 1970s, Gallo himself have shown that normal cells, when put in culture and they're stimulated or they're cultured with, PA, with PHA, they will start um, mm, mm, having reverse transcriptase activity. Montagnier put the bruised cells in a culture. Into culture, he added different growth factors, including PHA. And after 15 days, he detected reverse transcriptase activity. However, PHA by itself in normal cell, and this was known by Baresinus, the principal author, and Gallo proved it at the beginning of the 1970s, that the PHA itself causes reverse transcription in normal cells. So he put something in the cell which was causing a reverse transcription, and yet he said that this proves the existence of a, of a retrovirus there. So you're saying that what they found might just be the actual substance they put in the culture and not a virus? Definitely. That is, that is, that is, is their evidence. And Why would they do that? But as soon as he knew that in 1973, Gallo proved it at the beginning. In 1972, I think, was his paper. I don't know. Now, everybody accepts that reverse transcriptase activity is a characteristic of retroviruses, but it's not specific to retroviruses. But in all my interviews with scientists, they all say that reverse transcription is unique to retroviruses, and that's how they knew that there was a virus in their culture. Once you um, have produced, you know, you produce something in the extracellular medium, you can do actually several things. One thing is that if we expect or suspect it's a retrovirus, like HTLV-1, the leukemia virus, what we can do is look for uh, what we call reverse transcriptase activity, the enzyme which is unique to these viruses. Yeah, the scientific procedure was multifaceted. Uh, I mean, I had a good size lab, and so we had divided people up into different primary goals and uh, would meet daily. Uh, and the first goal was if a patient has fully developed AIDS, forget risk groups at the time. We didn't want to get into the risk group. You know, they, had, they had AIDS, documented AIDS. Could we take their blood, get their T cells like we would do with any 
This is like the leukemias, like we did with the leukemias. The same protocol as we did with leukemia. Take those T cells. Clean them up from other cells. Grow them with interleukin-2, our old friend. And see if we could find any evidence of release of virus particles and if we were right that they would be retroviruses and how to do that was with a surrogate marker. You don't use electron microscopy in those days except maybe one or two pictures just to confirm or to see the structure of this particular retrovirus. The assay was reverse transcriptase. Well, I don't know whom you interviewed, but if you don't believe me, go and ask Baltimore or Vermus and I'm sure they will confirm that reverse transcriptase activity is a characteristic of retroviruses, but it's not specific to them. What do you mean when you say reverse transcription is a characteristic of retroviruses, but not specific? Oh, well, let me give you an example. Hair is a characteristic of humans. You know, black, white, or yellow, we all have hair. But it's not specific, because there are many animals, for example, cats, dogs, which also have hair. And finding a hair in a room, it doesn't mean that a human being was there, or a cat or a dog. Are retroviruses the only ones that can reverse transcribe? Ah, uh, no. There are other forms of reverse transcription that are used in various, um, various ways inside the cell. For instance, the ends of chromosomes are made by a reverse transcription process. That's how they're maintained stable. The, um, there is reverse transcription in the inheritance of all of our cells, which comes about from endogenous genetic elements in the cells or in the cells of our ancestors. Because once that information gets into our, into our cells, into our genomes, it stays there forever. Um, so it could be that we've inherited information from monkeys or from other animals that are, that are in our, our uh, lineage. Um, and so, no, reverse transcription is actually very widespread. Something like 50% of the DNA in our cells comes about by reverse transcription. Oh, that much? Yes. Oh, wow. OK. That was 1% to 2%. <laughs> Going back to, uh, I thought it was 1.5 to 2%. Uh, the 50% that the retroviral DNA, or retroviral genes in our DNA, what biological function do they serve? Now, we've got to make a distinction. When I said 50%, I'm saying 50% of the DNA came about by reverse transcription. But it's not all retroviruses. Lots of it is just uh, repeated elements that are there as what we generally consider to be um, parasitic DNA. DNA, which is, as other people call it, selfish DNA. DNA, which is in there because it's able to copy itself and reintegrate itself in other places. And this is something that's going on all the time. Um, and it builds up. Why do you think they used reverse transcription to prove the existence of a virus if they knew that it wasn't specific to viruses? I don't know. It's as simple as this. I don't know. In fact, they went one step further. In the second experiment, they have taken the cells from their patient and mixed them with cells from a normal blood donor. And in that culture, again, they put PHA and other growth factors, substances, which make the cell to survive and grow. And again, they found reverse transcriptase activity. And this time, they claim that the finding of reverse transcriptase activity in the second culture proves that the virus was transmitted from the patient cells to the normal donor cells. And in fact, they say that this proves isolation of HIV. But they must have used some other criteria to state that they had a new virus. There was no other criteria in the first, they had a third experiment but in the first and second experiment, that's how they are described in, in their paper. It was the first experiment, reverse transcriptase activity. The second experiment, reverse transcriptase activity. They are the only evidence they have published. So in the From first, the first and the second experiment. So in both experiments, they fed the culture substances 
which artificially cause reverse transcription? Yes. Yes, they fed them. You know, just one of them, PHA, by itself, it will cause reverse transcription in normal cells, in non-infected cells. What are your problems with the third experiment? Well, the problems, first of all, again, they took the supernated, the fluid from their second experiment and put it in a culture which contained umbilical cord lymphocytes. And in that culture, they also found reverse transcriptase activity. Again, the reverse transcriptase activity, they already used there this PHA and other substances which can cause reverse transcription in any culture, if the conditions are right. Then we have the virus particles. They have published electromicrographs showing virus-like particles budding from the cells and released in the supernatant. But just seeing virus-like particles is no proof that the viruses, that they are viruses, because you can have virus-like particles and they're not viruses. In fact, the, 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 the third problem with the virus, with the particle, is that they use umbilical cord lymphocytes, which originate from placenta. In placenta, it was known in the 70s that they release virus-like particle and they have reverse transcriptase activity. So finding them in this culture is no proof that they originated from Montagnier's patient. In Montagnier's paper, they publish electron micrographs of HIV. No. We see pictures of the virus. We see pictures. These particles were in, uh, as I said, in umbilical cord lymphocytes. And umbilical cord lymphocytes originate from placenta. And there was already a lot of evidence by this time that placenta can release virus-like particles. What's more is Montagnier, when he described the particles he has seen, he said, these particles are typical type C particles. Viruses, uh, retroviruses are um, classified in different um, categories, which, one of which is type C particle. And they said that the virus they have seen is a typical type C particle. Typical type C particles have been many times published in the 1970s from normal placenta. In fact, most of the placentas was shown to have reverse transcriptase activity and typical type C particles. So finding these particles there, even if there are virus, they could have been just originating from the normal placenta. So finding the particles and finding reverse transcriptase activity in the umbilical cord lymphocyte culture does not prove that the patient was infected with a virus. The two main things that told you you had a retrovirus was the reverse transcriptase activity and the fact that the cells so died. That, and then we immediately uh, call our guy who was responsible for electron microscopy mm -hmm. and said, please, could you look on them under the microscope uh, whether you can see virus particle uh, and if uh, it resembles to a, a retrovirus. Okay. Okay. And what um, what did you see? What did you guys see when you looked under the electron microscope? And after after quite, uh, it was very difficult because it was only few cells infected, so it was a very difficult task for him uh, to find a cells that was just producing this particle. But finally, he found it, and he found one lymphocyte with a budding particle typical of retrovirus, and very close from these cells, one complete mature particle that resembled to a retrovirus. In that um, paper, he had only one electron micrograph, and the virus um, could be identified as sort of a retrovirus, but it could have also, could have also been an arena virus. Now, these are specifics that, that that are only important for experts. But when we saw that photo, we said, mm, suggestive, but not convincing. I've seen these publications, stamp-sized images. It's a nuisance. 
it's a nuisance. You do not really see much. And uh, I do not know how good electron microscopy was really done, but uh, they probably should have done a bit more. And then they would, they would have been very safe. And electron microscopy is an art and a science. Art and science. And nobody is able to judge what the electron microscopist is really doing. You have to have experts discussing these things. Sometimes people are far from the microscope. They do not understand structure and function. They like to have a nice image, that's all. They do not understand sometimes, and that's a danger. I could imagine if uh, Montagnier would have pushed the structure, the fine structure of HIV a bit more, he would have been more convincing. Would I be right in saying that from the pictures alone, though, in culture, you can't prove what virus you found yet? Of course, electron microscopy is not sufficient to, to prove you have a retrovirus. That's clear. You need uh, other characteristics like the density. The reverse transcriptase activity is the key, the key enzyme, uh, which is at well, that time was only associated with retroviruses. You know, that's... So how we describe it first, you know, we did describe the electron microscopy as a proof. Mm -hmm. We described the reverse transcriptase activity as, pro as a proof it was a retrovirus. But here also we were criticized. Uh, <laughs> some people from Gallo's lab saying, uh, are you sure you have a reverse transcriptase activity there? Could it be a cellular DNA polymerase? You know, we had this kind of question. So Montagnier, he wanted to show not only that he had a retrovirus, that, but that the retrovirus was new, was not one of the two other retroviruses which Gallo claimed to have discovered at the end of the 1970s and the beginning of 1980s in leukemic patients. For this, first of all, he said he purified HIV. He obtained by purification we all agree, he said, and Montagnier himself admits that to prove that uh, a virus is a new virus, then you have to show that it has proteins which were not present in any other retrovirus. And to do that, he said, you must purify the virus. He admitted that in 1997 that you must purify the virus. And in 1983, he claimed to have done exactly that, to have purified the HIV particle. Now, we may uh, have uh, differences as to what isolation means, but when it comes to purification, there is no disagreement. We, by purification, they mean to obtain particles, retrovirus particle, separate from anything else which, at, at least from anything else, which contains proteins and RNA. Now, when this virus is in this supernatant, it's not purified, okay? Because the cells are releasing plenty of things, not only the virus, mm -hmm. the cellular protein and so on, okay? Yeah. So that means that in the supernatant you have a mixture of everything, including the virus. Then you have to purify it. Okay. Okay. This is the second step. Then you try to purify the virus from all this mess. When uh, we started in the early 80s, we, we were trying to purify the virus by uh, a sucrose gradient. Retrovirus particles are purified using a laboratory procedure developed over 40 years ago known as density gradient centrifugation. The cell culture that is undertaken by the scientist to produce workable quantities of virus results in a liquid suspension made up of cells, macroscopic and microscopic cellular debris, virus particles, if any are present, and culture fluids. This suspension is spun in a low-speed centrifuge 
which creates a sediment consisting of the cells and heavier solid material, and, above the sediment, a liquid supernatant containing the much lighter microscopic material. If retroviral particles are present, this is where they will be distributed. Next, a small portion of the supernatant is removed and very gently placed on top of a solution of sucrose. This sucrose solution is prepared in a special way such that its density increases gradually from the top to the bottom of the tube. In this diagram, the layers of different densities are shown as discrete bands, but in the real world of the laboratory, these layers gradually merge into one another. Purification by this technique relies on the fact that particulate matter in the supernatant sample will gradually sink down through the sucrose solution until it reaches a place in the gradient where the sucrose solution and the particulate matter have the same density. When an object gets to this portion of the gradient, it cannot go any further. It is exactly like trying to force a tennis ball to stay put at the bottom of a bucket of water. As soon as you let it go, it bounces back up to where it wants to float according to its density in water. This means that in the sucrose density gradient, all objects of the same density will eventually congregate at the same place in the gradient. In the case of retrovirus particles, this is where the density of the sucrose reaches 1.16 grams per mil. Because the particulate matter in the culture supernatant is so light and tiny, the passage of the sample through the gradient has to be speeded up by spinning the tube in another kind of centrifuge known as an ultracentrifuge. This machine rotates the tube at speeds between 40 to 60,000 revolutions per minute and produces a force many thousands of times gravity. In this diagram we have assumed the supernatant sample contains retrovirus particles and you can see them gradually moving through the gradient and being arrested at the 1.16 grams per mil density. Here is a short demonstration to illustrate how a sucrose density gradient solution can be used to separate objects of different densities, in this case beans and macadamia nuts. In this simplified version we will use a two band density gradient consisting of water with a density of 1 gram per mil and sucrose at a density of approximately 1.5 grams per mil. First we prepare our sucrose solution by dissolving sucrose, ordinary table sugar, in water. Then we make our two density layer solution by carefully pouring our lower density layer, the water, on top of the denser sucrose layer. Next we place our sample on the top of the two layer solution. Since these objects are so much larger and heavier than virus particles, gravity is more than sufficient to propel them through the gradient. In fact, as you can see, in this experiment the separation is virtually instant. There is no need to spin the glass in a centrifuge. The result is one density band consisting of nothing but beans, and another density band consisting of nothing but macadamias. In other words, these objects have been successfully purified. What may not be obvious is the part your eyes play in this experiment. Without looking at the two density bands, which is equivalent to performing the electron microscopy, you will not be able to tell if any objects are present, what is their morphology, and whether or not they are pure. Well, what's the purpose of the purification then? Well, to, uh, to make sure uh, uh, you have a, a real virus, uh, you know, uh, so Montaigne claimed to, to prove that he had a, a particles, he had proteins which are not present in any other vi retrovirus, he purified the virus. But he did not publish any electron micrographs of the purified material to prove, you know, you see in his believing. And uh, they claimed that they had purified material, but there were no electron micrographs. And it, it is, this is one of the conditions where Barres and Jean-Claude Charmaine put it in 90, 1973. You must have picture of the purified virus and show that the material contains nothing else but particles with the same physical characteristics. But no such pictures were published. Is it important to photograph where the virus is banned? in the gradient? Yeah, <clears throat> because retrovirology has also some, some history. These are established techniques 
If you go to C-type particles, they can be easily bended and they are stable. And if you think HIV is another a new retrovirus, you have to go the same way, just to, to be acknowledged as, as a retrovirologist dealing with that new virus in a proper way. Hans Gelderblum, he said it's important to photograph the density gradient where virus is banned. Why is that an important step? Because uh, this is, I mean, electron microscopy, for example, it's always very important to see the morphology of the virus particle. Uh, it's in the region of the density gradient, okay, where you think you have a virus purified, and I will say in good shape. If you check after by electron microscopy, the electron microscopy will tell you, okay, you have the right structure of the virus particle with all the envelope which is uh, uh, on the surface of the membrane okay because very often when you make purification you uh, alter all this process making uh, sucrose gradients and centrifugation it's a uh, it forces, you know, on the virus, pressure on the viruses, and it does not like it too much. Mm -hmm. Especially for HIV, where the envelope uh, protein, which are anchored on, uh, on the membrane, are not uh, covalently anchored. So that means that uh, very easily you can lose the envelope protein. Now oh, the GP120? Uh, yeah. So it's important to check then on the uh, electron microscope whether the structure of your virus is the one that you are looking for. With all its viral protein, the envelope protein, structural protein, everything, you have the right shape, the right structure. And it also shows you what isn't there, correct? Exactly, also. So you're saying Montagnier never proved the existence of a new retrovirus because he didn't photograph in the test tube? Mm, or, as I said, he says it is essential to purify the virus to prove that there are, uh, they, they, it has proteins which are not present in any other virus. That's the only way to prove that you have a new virus. But he did not publish pictures. So since he did not publish pictures, we don't know what he had in his purified virus. May have, it is possible that he had purified virus, but it's possible that he did not have anything there. And that's what we've been asking from the very beginning. Why there were no pictures, which are essential to, to, to prove purification. When purifying, Gelder Bloom told me it's important to photograph the density gradient where virus is banned. Why is that a crucial step? Well, Gader Blom, I know him well, he's a good electron microscopist in, in Berlin. And actually, um, he gave me the best picture of my virus. Oh, really? <laughs> yes. <laughs> well, of course, in order to, to purify, you have to make this uh, sucrose gradient density uh, an equilibrium uh, to have a sharp band. And if you take that sharp band, you have uh, almost uh, pure. Not completely pure, because there are cell, uh, cell vesicles which have the same density. This is why you don't see uh, in, in the picture, you have a mixture of uh, uh, cell uh, vesicles, cellular vesicles and viral particles. So, is it, is it really important or is it not really important? For us, it's not important. No. But uh, some people say, if you don't have complete purification, how do you know the disease is caused, it's not caused by something else? To silence them, how come you guys didn't just show pictures from the gradient instead of just the culture? We, we, we first show it from the culture. Mm. By, just by centrifugation, you know, but not sequence gradient, just by making a pellet of the virus, you could uh, look at it also this way. But you, uh, here, of course, you have many impurities you know, coming from the cell. The sucrose gradient has the advantage to partly purify the virus, but again, even in the band of the virus, you have also cellular vesicles, which have the same density. 
but not the same look, of course, at the electron microscope. And you're saying that in the purified banding area, there can be other contaminants, and that's why pictures are essential? They, yes, in the purified, the, the method they used, you can get, by this method, you can get material which, has, which is not viral, but it has proteins, it's cellular fragments. You know, the cellular fragments can, with this method he's using, could be at the same place. And then you can have there only cellular fragments, or you can have a mixture of cellular fragments and, and viruses. But it's important, it's extremely, it's, it's crucial to have a picture. If you separate by density 1.15 gram per ml, you have a lot of vesicular stuff inside, mm -hmm. not related to virus. <laughs> Mm -hmm. Detritus, a reaction product of the cell. You have a lot of host cell constituents in that band. That's not too nice. So are there other particles that can look like retroviruses in that, in that band? Yes. In that material you can have cellular fragments and they have proteins and they have RNA, which retroviruses have. And in fact, they may even look like retrovirus particles. So it is important to have, it is crucial to have an electron micrograph of the material for, for us, for example, and for many, any other scientists to believe what they are claiming. When you purify HIV, there are some challenges because the contam it's contaminated with cellular debris. But I said. And particles that look like retroviruses but are not infected. Yes, as I said. How do you distinguish between what is infective and what isn't? You cannot. Montagnier gives a very, himself gives a very, gives crucial importance to this band because he said if the particles do not bend, at the 1.16 gram per mil band, then they are not retrovirus particles. The world See? accepted those papers and the pictures that he did present as being evidence of a new virus. Well, the world accepted these pictures, and the world accepted that Montaigne proved the existence of HIV, but this is what we have not accepted from the very beginning. We've been questioning, we've been asking in scientific papers, and today neither Montaigne nobody, or anybody else has uh, responded to these uh, questions. Isn't there a chance that you're wrong since everybody concedes that Montagnier did isolate HIV and purify it? Well, who's seen it? We're giving you the evidence. And it's, to me, this evidence, and to my colleagues, this evidence does not prove the existence of HIV. Now, most of the people may have not even read the, the Montagnier paper. And yet they accept that Montagne proved the existence of HIV. We must not forget that doctors are very busy. And we, you, it is very hard for everyone to go and study in detail uh, all the claims. You have, to, you have to really put a lot of effort to put all the things together. But it's been 26 years since Montagnier published his papers. In 26 years, billions of dollars have been spent on HIV research. So doesn't the fact that, isn't, isn't Montagnier's paper kind of antiquated? I mean, hasn't it been proven that HIV does exist in the past 25, 26 years? Well, nobody has presented any better evidence for the existence of HIV than Montagnier and Gallo. Gallo presented similar evidence. Apart, the difference between Gallo and Montagnier was that Gallo used, uh, instead of umbilical t uh, lymphocyte T cells, he used uh, the leukemic cell line. Uh, but 
Otherwise, they, they, they publish the same findings. And their findings today, still even today, are the best evidence anyone has presented for the existence of HIV. So let's go to the test tube. What did Montagnier find in the purified band? Montagnier took the proteins from that band, which he said, or the material he said was purified HIV, and then he reacted them with sera from his patient. And in the purified material, he found three proteins which reacted with antibodies, which were present in the sera of his patient. P80, P45, 41 now, and P24. He said 41 was a cellular protein which contaminated his virus, made no mention of P80, and he said P24 was viral. Well, the question is, why only P24 viral and not P80? From antibody-antigen reaction, you cannot prove the origin either of the antibody or the, the, the protein. And he tried, he did not have evidence that P24 was coming from a particle. In fact, we did not know that there were any particles there. And then he said, he defined it by this reaction that P24 was viral and the antibodies were viral. This cannot be done scientifically. HIV is said to have nine proteins. Yes. But, um, but Montagnier only found one protein yes. in his purified culture. That's one of the big questions. If what he had there, what he called purified virus, it was HIV, and so it will have had all the proteins which a virus has, which HIV has, nine or ten proteins. And the patient, if they paid the antibodies which reacted with the P24, should have, should have been also antibody to all these other proteins. And yet, he did not have, the patient did not have any antibodies to react with the other proteins, and we don't know if he had any of the other proteins. So this is a big question. You cannot have a virus which has only one protein. The question is now, if that was a, a protein, if he had purified virus, where were the other proteins? And if the patient was infected with the virus, where are the other antibodies? How can we, we have only one protein and one antibody? It is not, not possible. But unlike Montagnier, who considered P24 the only HIV protein, and 41 as being a cellular protein, Gallo, in 1984, considered 41 as the most specific HIV protein, and not a cellular protein. So maybe Montagnier was just wrong and Gallo was right. Unless you know that you have a purified virus, Unless you have evidence that there was a purified virus, you don't know which one is right. Because Gallo did not have any electron micrographs. Gallo could have said that 41 is uh, HIV if and only if he had published electron micrographs and showed that what he called purified virus had nothing else but virus-like particles. Now, the next criticism is that Montagnier's particles, he said that his particles are ty typical type C viruses. Then, in 1984, he said that his particles were type D particles. In Levy, at the same time, said that they were type D particles. Um, Gallo, again in 1984, said that he, the, the particles he seen were belonging to the family to, to which his previous viruses existed. And, so the, and they are type C particles. The, f, the two part retroviruses Garo claimed to have discovered they were type C particles. And then, from, from about 1985, 86, most of the HIV experts start saying that HIV is a lentivirus belonging to a totally a different subfamily of retroviruses. And, and even today, there is still disagreement as to what, even as to what subfamily and species the HIV particles belong. Anywhere you travel in the world, you're going to find somebody 
that generally looks like somebody else. And when I look at electron micrographs, all viruses look the same to me. So is there really a difference between whether it's a C or a D or a lentivirus? Is it that big a deal? Well, there is a big deal because they belong to different, according to retrovirologists, they belong to different, not only to different species, but to different subfamilies. And this is not different than saying that people saying that they see, you know, one and the same thing, and yet what they see, some see a human being, others see a chimpanzee, and others see a gorilla. The difference is that much. We all belong to the same family. Chimpanzee, humans, and gorillas belong to the same family. All the retroviruses belong to the retroviral family. But we are in different species, and so are uh, the HIV particles. Would a trained eye be able to look under the microscope and easily distinguish between a type C, a type D, and a lentivirus? That's what they say. That's what the electron microscopy say.